The reform cycles are an intervention that the federal government has taken, a strategy to coordinate the activities of reforms. So before now, different reforms occurred in, in pockets, but now taking a systemic approach, we're able to have momentum. And that's why we go through 60-day national action plans. We've been to three so far. The fourth one is starting on the 1st of March. And as you said, the entire reform cycle for the year, like sort of the PEBEC agenda for the year, was agreed in November of 2018. So are the reform cycles sector specific now, or do they cover all sectors of the economy? I wouldn't say that they're sectorial. They are more enablers. We work with indicator areas, starting a business, dealing with construction permits, paying taxes, uh, access to credit, trading within Nigeria. And in that, you have a number of things. But the important thing, I think, to note is that for SMEs, we're working on efficiency, we're working on transparency for the public servants dealing with you. And from the private sector end, we're making sure that we're reducing cost and time and we're enhancing transparency and access to information. The conversations at the Stakeholders Forum has been sort of an opportunity to assess PEBEC scorecard. Looking back now, three years on, and then when you think about the fact that Nigeria moved upward the World Bank uh, rankings, ease, ease of doing business rankings last year, dropped marginally in the latest World Bank's doing business rankings. What did not work? You know, the truth is that we actually moved up. But what it is is that some others moved higher up. So if you're standing still, you're moving backwards. Africa has been consistently, Sub-Saharan Africa, for the last three years, the highest reforming region. So our score went up about 2%. And, you know, we did, we had a number of reforms that were recorded, but some other countries moved higher up. So we ended up coming down a rank, but our actual score moved up. So it's like tying in a, it's like tying in a race. When two people come second, the next person comes fourth. So we can take it because we're not focusing so much on numerical rankings. What we're focusing on is impact. We know what we have on the table. Communication is key. We have so many reforms, but private sector, not all of them. Some people have known about this project from, since 2016, since inception. Some people are hearing about it for the first time today. It's very important, and that's why we have this year a strategic communications, because if private sector don't know, then they can't enjoy the impact. And at the end of the day, what we really want is to feel the impact on the economy. So we can take the lag, we know that the reforms are being done. We know that it's ongoing. We know that we continue to go step by step. And that's why we can confidently say that we're going sub-100 this year, because we know what was left on the table last year and what to do. What to do is to make sure that private sector know about the reforms and validate them. And I see that the pro your projections, uh, one of your key projections is to make, is to achieve uh, top 100 ranking of the World Bank's doing business report by the year 2020, which is less than a year from now. Speak to me, how realistic is that based on current realities? Yeah, so the, the, to be frank, we've moved up 24 places in aggregate in the last three years. We are currently 146. Now we want to move 46 places up yeah. to 100. You know, what gets measured gets done. Before 2015, we had, for the previous eight years, gone down almost 70 places, if you look at rankings. But what it is is that there was no coordinated approach. We first of all stemmed the tide, moved up one place, then moved up a bang of 24 places, which is what everybody remembers. It's perception, it's good. But what I want to tell you is that we were actually implementing reforms, so we've moved up 11 basis points in three years. That is really what is important. Now, last year, a number of reforms were not captured by the World Bank because private sector did not know about them. So there's a bit of a lag. So our job is to make sure that you don't only do the work, but you tell people that need the reforms that those reforms have been done. Why should someone be sweating it out, going across town to a tax office when you can file your taxes online? Why should someone be so concerned about starting a business? Or oh, I'm in Lagos, do I have to go to Abuja? When you can do it online, you can reserve a name, you can register a business in, in less than a day. So these are the things that Nigerians need to know, and even people outside Nigeria need to know. Access to information is key. The reforms are there but they need to be utilized. 
And while we, we do care about ranking and perceptions, we care so much more about the impact of these reforms across the country. I see the, omni uh, the omnibus bill did take center stage of discourse at some point. What is strategic about this bill at this time? This is a strategic legal intervention that has been used very smartly by a few countries. So we measure global best practice and we come for best fit for Nigeria. Countries like Mauritius, New Zealand, Canada, Australia have used the legislative tool of harnessing a number of irritants. We need to make sure that we have legal underpins to some of the reforms that we've done so that they don't unravel. We need to make sure that we scoop our laws and get rid of the legacy irritants, like things like common seals and things that we, they're just relics of the past. It's the first time Nigeria is going to do this, but we know that we can do it because we've partnered very well with the National Assembly. Now, apart from the omnibus bill, two other issues that were top, that were hot topic during the forum so far were um, access to finance and electricity. To what extent will the new cycle of reforms be, put, be pursuing these two key elements as far as ease of doing business goes in Nigeria? This administration has focused on infrastructure. We all know Nigeria has had an infrastructure deficit. Under the Economic Recovery and Growth Plan, we focus on power, we focus on roads and rail, and broadband. Now, for the first time, an administration has taken on focusing on the legislative bottlenecks. In the power area, first of all, the Minister of, Industry, of Power, Works and Housing is a member of the council and has been working, as you know, on making sure that the supply of power has improved across the country. But beyond that, businesses need to access power. You need to get your new buildings connected to the grid. That process had had some, legisl some bureaucratic bottlenecks. So we here at EBIS, we focus on removing that. There are about nine procedures needed to connect to the grid, and we reduce that to seven. Access to credit, uh, there was this challenge, especially by SMEs, on having to have landed property as collateral. We've uh, talked with private sector, those are the lenders, and they said it's because they needed the comfort to be able to lend to SMEs. So we said that we created a national collateral registry domiciled at the CBN, to enable a system, and we passed the legislation with the National Assembly in 2017, to enable a system whereby non-movable property, that stock, um, your machinery, your agri-produce can be used as collateral uh, for, for bank loans. So we're now encouraging microfinance banks to lend to SMEs because you have this portal that tracks all the charges so people cannot easily default. That enabling environment that has been created ranked Nigeria number six in the world in access to credit because we also passed a legislation that enhances the credit history um, system for Nigeria. So now you also have credit histories. So with having credit histories and being able to use your movable property as collateral, we've enabled the environment.